Welcome to the Nitpicking Nerds. Today, we're doing our Worth It series. This time, we're talking about which ramp spells are worth playing in Commander. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, BZ, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds, bringing you daily content. If you're loving that, subscribe to the channel so we know. And if you're really loving us, you can help support us on Patreon. That'd be awesome. What are we doing? We're talking about ramp spells today. We're going to tell you what they are because we have to define what a ramp spell is so that we can tell you which ones are good to play, the expectations, the standards, what we're looking for in those ramp spells, and our priorities. We're going to show you what we would play and explain why we would play it. Totally. So let's start with what is a ramp spell? Well, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Uh, it's a spell that grants permanent access to additional mana resources over time. The only thing we're not talking about in this video is mana rocks. We have a whole separate worth it, which you should go check out about mana rocks. Yes. So if you are interested in mana rocks and for a lot of non-green decks and stuff like that, check those videos out. But now we have to get into expectations and standards. This means what are we looking for in a ramp spell? When we see a ramp spell, what do we think makes it playable? Yeah. What makes us actually, you know, there's a hundred ramp spells in front of you. What makes you take certain ones and put them into your deck over anything else? First thing we're going to look at, and probably the most important is synergy. It has to go with your strategy so that your whole deck is just this cohesive uh, blend of cards that are going to focus on whatever your main plan is and then just execute it. And all the ramp spells are going to help work for you when you put synergy in. So I think the most important thing here to look at is that there are a ton of good ramp spells. There's a lot, 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 lot hundreds. of good ramp. Hundred, maybe not hundreds, but like at least 50 good ramp spells. So when you, you can't just throw 50 ramp spells in your deck. You can't take every good ramp spell and throw it in your deck. That's not going to work. So the best thing to do is to go, okay, well, this one might be slightly better than this, like this, but like this one has synergy. So take the synergy because all those synergies are going to add up to something way better than this card that's an inch better. For example, a creature that ramps one land versus a spell that ramps one and a half lands. Well, the creature matters in every zone, not just the stack or the battlefield. It's going to help you. 100% of the time this game is going, it'll help you. And, you know, the Cultivate or whatever helps you right now and never again. Yes. The next expectation is low mana cost. You want to be ramping early in the game. So if you have a seven mana spell that's going to ramp you, well, that's not as interesting because you're already in the late game when you have seven mana. Are you supposed to ramp into ramp? When are you supposed to play your threats? You want to play your threats on, you know, six, seven, eight mana, not go ramp spell, ramp spell, and now... Ramp spell. Just wait, guys. Threat's coming eventually. Really big ramp spell. Yeah, so it, exactly. So low mana is going to be a high priority. Putting lands into play untapped. This isn't a ton of them, but there are some that do this. And this this really gives them a boost. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. It just plays into the low mana cost. If a spell costs four, mm -hmm. but it puts two lands into play untapped, well, it really only costs two. So it's actually a low mana cost card. Yes, exactly. So you can actually, it makes double spelling very easy. Color fixing. Uh, if you're if you have a card that only gets a forest in your three color deck, not not, not as interesting. But if it gets a non basic forest, way more interesting because yeah. you can get those shock lands. Yeah, now we're talking. And then uh, finally, you want to make sure your ramp helps ramp out your commander, especially if you're. I mean, most commanders are really important to the game plan. So you kind of want to make your ramp tune it so that you can ramp out your commander. For example, if you have a three mana commander, maybe consider some one mana dorks to help play it on turn two instead of turn three. And if you have a seven mana commander. Now you're really interested in like four mana ramp that puts two in play because that'll put you from four right to seven next turn. Yes, ex exactly. So look at how you're going to be casting commander. And I would say probably a good thing overall is like, let's say your commander costs four. You're probably not going to play four mana ramp spells because most of the time on that fo turn four, you're just going to want to be playing your commander. You're certainly not too many, not like three or four. You're yeah. not going to jam it up, maybe one. So now we have to get into our favorites, what we're going to play. And then we're going to tell you because there's so many here, what decks we think they're good in and where we would play them because we don't just throw these in any decks. But these first three, these are really the cards I put in like every single green deck. I, you'd be hard pressed not to find me putting them in a green deck. So Nature's Lore, Three Visits, and Sky, Sh Sky Shroud Claim. So Nature's Lore and Three Visits both get one force and put them in the play untapped. If they can also get shock lands, so in duels, so that is amazing, amazing for these. They also don't have to come in untapped, so you can get a shock tapped if you're not going to use it. Uh -huh. And Sky Shroud Claim does it for two. Yes, uh, these three, they're not auto-includes. I don't play them in every deck, uh, but if your deck is not a creature deck, then yep, they're going in my deck. These are like the three pillars of ramp. If you're not a creature deck and you want ramp, these are going right in. 
See, I even play them. Like, I'm playing a Gruul Stompy deck that's mostly creatures. I'm still playing these. Well, it's different, though. I mean, I'm talking about, like, a creature graveyardy deck. You're talking, okay, you're, so you're talking about an aristocrat. You're talking about, like, the green. Let's say Marin. I would never play these in Marin. Yes, that's fair. So you're talking, you're talking about the great, that's, a, that's very specific. Yeah. If you're playing the, the Marins and the Carador type decks, but that, they're, that's its own thing. I think that those two don't want to play this, but other than that, I'm throwing these almost in every single green deck I can, especially when you get in the two colors, because the fact that they fix you is amazing. Yes. I mean, I guess I'd also say like Elf Ball. Yes, Elf Ball. But too. past those three, this list here that we're about to run through, there's like 50 cards on it. This is like almost every ramp spell we would ever play. So I guess if you really want to like, if you're a really big fan of our advice, you can just like take these cards in a pool and then go, and when you build a deck, which one of these work with my deck? So the next little batch is Harrow and Spring, Spring Bloom Druid, which are just, they only ramp you one, but if you're a landfall, you get two triggers. Yes. So you're only you're probably only going to play these in landfall decks where you absolutely care about the two triggers because ultimately three mana to ramp one isn't where you want to be. It's not what you want to be doing, but there also is the upside of like, maybe you want to flick at the Spring Bloom. Spring Bloom. Why is that so? We both say? messed up. Yeah. Spring Bloom Druid. If you want to flicker that, that also has the upside of that, but there's better stuff than that. Like Wake. Wood Elves, Firehaven Elf, Yavimaya Granger, and Elvish Rejuvenator. These all enter, give you an ETB, and get you a land in the battlefield. Again, if you care about the creature or you can flicker it. Yeah, these are the cards that start to matter with synergy. They're worse than Cultivate in a vacuum. We don't play in a vacuum. They're better than Cultivate if your deck cares at all about having creatures in the yard, in your hand, in play, triggering when you cast them. They're going to get more value than just a land. Yavimaya Granger just goes ahead and puts itself in the graveyard. Oh, that's an experience counter for Marin. That's a creature count for Undergrowth. That's whatever else these cards do for you. And they're all sweet. I like Elvish Rejuvenator if you're looking for specific lands too, like Valkut and Field of the Dead. Yeah, if you really want to try and find some important land, like your deck has like three or four really important lands, mm -hmm. that getting them out is going to be crucial. I mean, he hits any land. He also whiffs very rarely, but I did, funnily enough, I just pl I played a game on Saturday with a couple people in the Discord. <laughs> It whiffed. It was hilarious. I think it's like 90% it hits. It's Oh, it's so high. The, the percentage is actually really high that it hits. Five cards is a lot. Yes. What is the next grouping? The next grouping is uh, extra lands, putting more lands into play. So we have Azusa, Grove Spiral, Explore, Dryad of the Elysian Grove, and Wayward Swordtooth. The box, this these ones check is they put lands into play untapped, one of those priorities we talked about earlier, and so their cost ends up going way down. Azusa costs three. Then if you put two lands in play, she really only cost you one. And you just played extra lands, so you kind of took extra game actions that you wouldn't be able to take. These ones are special. They don't go on every deck, but when your deck has a high concentration of lands and landfall triggers, oh yeah, they go in your deck big time. And Ramunap takes them out of the graveyard. Yes, Ramunap takes them out of the graveyard. Ramunap also works really well with the Azuzas and the Dryad of the Elysian Groves, where it's like you can play your extra lands. Um, I know not everyone's playing with super not budget, but... Fetch lands, oh my god, Raymond Pets Creator goes crazy for him. You tell me you can't just play Time Warfare Expanse? It's still insane. Yeah, it's, it is still completely insane. And you get to play uh, Fabled Passage. So Fabled Passage is decently cheap. Uh, Terramorphic and uh, Evolve Wines, that's, that's three. So you can still build for it without, uh, you have to take a little bit of a hit, but you can still do some good things. You can still go off. And then when you're getting landfall triggers, how about Lotus Cobra? It comes in, it's kind of like a mana dork. It taps for one a turn because you're probably playing one land. And then if you put in extra work, that's when it actually makes your deck. If it taps for two or more, it's a pretty exceptional card. And then there's big turns you can have where you return all your lands from the graveyard to play or search, scape shift for like ten, eight or ten lands. And then now it's just take an extra turn. Yeah. And on top of that, this card, again, with fetch lands, fetch lands are just, it just makes two mana every single time. You can just, so you can just wait on, so uh, to your turn three, mm -hmm. go play this card. Okay. Spend two mana, play a fetch land. Now you get the two mana back. You just played a free Lotus Cobra. It's going to be out in the field until the next turn or until it dies. Yeah, it costs zero and it kind of has haste if you want to count it as a mana dork. Yes, Lotus Cobra is a very strong card. And other ones, they kind of fit. These are all enchantments, so they go together. I think these two, the Exploration, the Burgeoning, they're your extra landfall cards. Just like your Azusa's, just like your Child of the Elysian Groves, you want them in the same type of decks. And the next two are Wild Gro Growth and Utopia Sprawl, which you want in your Enchantress decks, I think, uh, because they're enchantments that ramp you. One mana, put it on land, you immediately get the mana back. Yeah, I actually want all four of these in Enchantress decks. The one thing Enchantress decks will do is draw a bunch of cards, and that's great, but you're going to find that you're too high on resources. So when you draw, you know, three, four cards a turn, oh, extra lands, and then I'm going to stuck, you know, I'm passing the turn with, 
let's say three spells and four lands in my hand because you kind of like whiffed. Well, burgeoning is going to ramp you three on the following turn and they're so cheap. They fit the low cost and for Enchantress, Synergy, they fit the two most important things. Wild Growth and Utopia Sprawl are free. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's completely fair. I actually didn't think about uh, that because in Enchantress decks, you get to play so many Enchantresses to just draw you cards for each one of these. Yeah, now I agree with what you're saying. It makes, basically, they let you play twice as much magic. Yeah, it makes it makes a ton of sense. Also, on top of that, the Exploration and the Burgeoning do also fit in your, in your Landfall decks. Oh, yeah. So Exploration and Burgeoning, I want to actually talk about this. I don't think Burgeoning is good in the Landfall deck. I do think Exploration is amazing in the Landfall deck. You're not trying to get triggers in other players' turns. You're trying to do it all on your turn, really. Yeah, I just, okay. I just thought that was a... I just wanted to bring that up because I've had that discussion with some people where Burgeoning versus Exploration in your Landfall deck, Landfall, Exploration, any other deck that can... Burgeoning's awesome. So it's like a blue-green card. Yeah. You, want, you need card draw for Burgeoning. You just need... Landfall for exploration. Exactly. Just to clarify that. Next, Sakura Tribe Elder and Diligent Farmhand, creatures that put themselves in the graveyard and function very similarly to other ramp spells. Um, Sakura Tribe Elder is just rampant growth, but it's a creature. So if your deck cares, it's just better. Like, it's just a better magic card. Yeah, this one, uh, Sakura Tribe Elder is close to the, the staple one uh, up near the nature's lore, where it's like, if I, if I had to just pick four spells... It's probably number four. And I don't know what the deck is. Those are probably the four spells I pick. Sakura Tribal that just has so many synergies all over the place. Like you said, if you care about a creature at all, this card is very good. Now, even 1% over, you know, not caring about a sorcery at all. Diligent Farmhand's a nice second copy of Sakura Tribal when you're doing graveyard creature stuff or like critical mass. You just want all the permanents to be creatures. Why do you always leave off the most important part of Diligent Farmhand? It's a muscle verse. I keep forgetting. Jeez. I just... So in your muscle burst decks, yeah, it's an auto include. I just don't understand why you always forget. That. It's so important. It's my favorite part of the card. I just, <laughs> I just forget it. I'm ashamed. <laughs> you should be ashamed. What's next? Uh, uh, next is all one mana mana dorks, which I want to just talk about by themselves. If you're building really, really, really tuned high power CDH level decks, these are almost always going to be your choice. Yeah. Yeah. You just go to these right away. These are these are the cream of the crop for super competitive high power decks. Absolutely awesome. Uh, some other ones. Gyre Sage, those only fear plus one plus one counters. Like same thing with Incubation Druid. These two are just okay cards, but as soon as you can augment getting counters on them, like just throw a counter on it from anywhere, one taps, one becomes a, uh, what is it? Guild of Lotus. Lotus, which is super awesome. The other one has no limit. It can just be, it can have like seven, eight, nine mana potentially. Yes. And then there's also Bloom Tender, which cares about colors. I want to be three plus colors before I'm playing this. Then it feels great. I mean, honestly, you're not that bad at two. It's, pretty like it's above average at two mm -hmm. just not super exciting so your deck want you're gonna have to want a mana dork that makes two first and not every deck wants that but once you're four or up you know i might just play this for fun uh selvala heart of the wilds this card is ridiculous i don't i it's kind of a mana dork and it's kind of just a messed up magic card but we it certainly is ramp i think the most important thing for savala heart of the wild is make sure that you can play powerful creatures and don't let your opponents take advantage of it more than you in that way. And that's the only thing that I'm going to caveat because as soon as you are going to be playing, if your commander has a high power, that might even be enough to just put this card in your deck. It's so crazy how fast this thing gets out of hand. You play a five drop, draw a card, make five mana. Okay. Cast another five drop. Well, okay. She also color fixes you perfectly. And is, is that check box checked off the ramp? Yeah. Uh, one distinction to make, when we define what ramp actually is, these mana dorks are permanent sources of ramp, meaning they stay out, they're just going to keep making mana. Whereas a ritual, that's not ramp. Not, not how we're talking about it anyway. Mm. You know, add three mana, that's fine, but it's not permanent source of advantage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, We're talking about things that provide you uh, overturns. If the card stays out for, say it's a mana dork, if it stays out for a turn, it'll provide you something more. And it'll keep, it'll keep providing you that until, you know, it's, it's gone. Right. It, it can go away, but it's still a permanent source. It'll keep doing it. Uh, up next, we have... So we're moving out of green a little bit here. Yes. Uh, green is obviously the best color for ramp, if you didn't know that. By a little bit. By by the, <laughs> the tiniest of margins. Thinnest of margins. Uh, but we have Walking Atlas and Terrain Generator. These are, one's a two-mana artifact that taps to put a land in play. The other one is a land, taps, and you pay two to put a land from your hand into play. So what we're doing here is we want to be drawing a ton of cards. Yes. Know? Uh, and you have to not be in green. Let's be super clear about that. You have to not be in green to want these cards at all. But if you have a ton of card draw and a ton of card velocity, this will allow you to draw a ton of cards and get extra lands into play so that you're not just piling like 
six, seven, eight lands in your hand, all of a sudden you're putting them on the field, which means you can do more spells, which means you can do more things, which means you can put more lands in play. Yeah, it's the burgeoning effect. Walking Atlas in a heavy card draw blue deck is exploration. It's the same thing. You just have to untap with it, and now every single turn it's going to do it. Terrain Generator is worse, but it's a land, barely takes up any effort to play it, and it does put a, only a basic in and it's tapped. But if you hold up mana, nobody does anything super important. Well, now you can ramp and basically just put an extra land into play that would never have gotten there if the game had progressed even to the end because you're just playing a land every single turn. Yes. Just be be very sure with these cards. Do not just toss them in any deck. No. You need the card draw. You need a high card velocity. You're, you need to be you need to be drawing cards like probably like every other turn. Like you really want to make sure you're drawing cards. I mean, Walking Atlas is very similar to other cards that exist like Sakura Tribe Scout, which is where our, our uh, Peace Out Tribe Scout comes from. It is. Those go in like AC and Tatiova decks where Landfall draws you cards. So they have multiple homes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. The Sakura, I forgot about. Uh, actually, that's one that we didn't have on this list, but it's another now. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah. The, that's the green version. Those ones are also fine. They're they're nothing crazy. I still just want my explorations mostly over that. They can be part of combos. So if that's the case, rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The card is not. They're definitely nowhere near unplayable. I just not a card that I look for unless there's specific synergies. Next is two more green cards. These ones are going to help find specific lands that kind of tutors if you have a land you really like, like the best land ever, Field of the Dead. They're Piers Whim and Hour of Promise. Piers Whim is also removal, so this card is nuts. You get your best land tapped, and then each player sacrifices an artifact or enchantment. Hour of Promise gets your two best lands. Yes, so Piers Whim is also political because you get to... I, I like this card because Magic uh, often... It's not just about winning when you sit down and you play commander. If somebody is missing land drops and doing nothing, I often will be like, all right, go get a land. Yeah, I'll play this. You get a land. You two sack. All right, let's let's just play the game. I want to, as much as I want to win and I do enjoy winning, I do also want everyone to have fun. Well, just to be clear, Piers Whim is 100% playable good mm -hmm. without that. And the fact that you can do that is an extra bonus yes. that adds fun and doesn't subtract power. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't subtract power at all because you're never forced to do that. No. It's when you play this, you can, you always, you 99% of the time, you choose foe, 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 yeah. friend. I'm my own friend. And I'm my own friend. Uh, and 1% of the time when you just want to have more fun, you give someone a land. Yeah, if somebody feel bad, you know, playing against... I've definitely had it where I've done that before. Yes. And then there's Hour of Promise. Uh, I really like this card. This is expensive. Five mana is a lot, but you get any two lands. And I really like this. I play this in my Omnath deck. One, it gets me two land drops for my Omnath, which is triggering it, getting me mana. But on top of that, you can just my most important land for the deck is Field of the Dead. I get the Field of the Dead, I put it on the field, and it triggers twice because Field of the Dead enters at the same time as the other land. Even if I was just on five mana, now I go to seven and I get two zombies. It feels really good. And if you already have Field of the Dead in play, you go get Vesuva and then you get four zombies. Yes. I really I am honestly like it's weird because like this is this kind of this one kind of feels like it pushes out of a lot of the doesn't fit our priorities. A lot of our priorities, but I really like this card. Make sure you, you need priority land. That's exactly what these are, because these don't these get any land, and that's what pushes them to the um to the premium slot. So you need to have those premium lands. You have a Gaius Cradle. There's so many Gaius Cradle, Urbor, Cabal Coffers, those kind of things. Those that's what you want to be getting. Basically, do not play these cards if they are going to search for Forest Mountain yes. or you know Highland Lake Hinterland Harbor. Like, no, no, we need really good lands for them. Uh more non-greens now. These are the Ixalan Flip Lands, Search for Escanta, Thematic Compass, Journey to Eternity, and Growing Rights of Itlamak are our favorites. I think more or less all of them are playable to good. Uh, these are the best ones. They're just going to ramp you in a weird way. They are ramp, though. Thematic Compass is one I put in most of my non-green decks. I really like this card. I'm a big proponent of it. It ramps late in the game. It does ramp late. You have to get a lot of lands in play. But it helps you not miss your land drops and do a couple of things. I really do like this card. Um... On top of these, we have a whole video. Oh yeah, uh, where we talk about these flip lands and just go check that out. It's uh, what's it called? It's called. It's uh, time to put the flip lands in your deck because they're really good. Time to put the Ixalan flip lands in your deck. They're really good. Yeah, go check out that video if you want more information about these flip lands. Yeah, they're they're very great. Uh, the Mana Compass is like our go-to. If we had to build a template, like we're not going to, but if we had to build a template that says, "Hey, every non-green deck, just throw in these ramp spells and you'll be pretty good." The Mana Compass is in there, and it for me one hundred percent replaced Maze of Ith, I'm never going to play that card again. Yeah, exactly. People really like Maze of Ith, and I, I think it's it's cool. Maze of Ith is, it has, it just, it does have a, hot, a lot of upside. We see it, 
because we see it when we play thematic compass. We, we see it on the the Maze of Ith with no downside. Yeah, exactly. We, th- but it also tests for land. And I understand putting Maze of Ith in the deck once in a while. I'm never, I'm never going to do it, though. Right. I mean, not when you have thematic compass. It's yes. so, so much less of a cost for you to pay. Uh, next, more more staples, uh, as it were. Solemn Smulacrum, Wayfarer's Bobble, Burnished Heart, and Sword of the Animus. These are like bread and butter. I'm not green, but I need ramp. Yes. I mean, Solemn Smulacrum's going in almost every single of my non-green decks especially because i don't play hyper competitive yeah so it's just it's a staple when you're not playing hyper competitive same with wafers bubble and burnish i think those all all three of those are just kind of my i'm not in green let me start pulling out cards to ramp they go in there and if i'm playing a decent number of creatures even bigger thumbs up to thor to the sword of the animus i love this card i I've even put it in some green decks and not been disappointed. I can run away with the game. You kind of feel like, oh, no one's answering this? Guys, this is really bad for you. I just got four lands out. Uh, the worst one on here, if your deck can attack, is probably Burnished Heart. Mm-hmm. It's the slowest. Um, if you have ways to like reduce the activated abilities or the cost of it, now we're talking. Yeah, we're talking about non-green for these. But again, Sword of the Animus, if you're really, really... Um, creature heavy, it, it's... It's I, nuts. It's nuts. It's just... It's, it's a... It's... Farseek every single turn that doesn't cost mana if they don't make you equip it again, I'm in. Um, Actually, it's rampant growth every turn. I'm sorry. You can't get a mountain and a forest. Okay. Oh, no. Next, what is it? Uh, next is the medallions. These um give you mana advantage. They don't do, they don't put lands in the play. So the medallions are monocolored decks. That's all they're for. Um, or maybe like a if you're playing a black white deck that's super heavy white or super heavy black, then you might want to go. These uh, you just you don't want these in green. Uh, so all the other medallions, uh, you want you, every spell costs one less in your deck because you're playing mono red, except for your artifacts. Which whatever, I'm totally in for this. These are if you haven't played a medallion in a monocolor deck, you haven't lived. Yeah, <laughs> the they get better as your deck can cast more spells in a turn. So where are they best? Well, the blue one and the red one are the best in storm decks. Uh, if you're playing a dragon tribal deck. It's just going to be okay. It's kind of going to be Fire Diamond. It's going to essentially tap for one each turn. But if you're casting three spells a turn, two mana rock, make three mana every turn. Okay, that's re- that's crazy. You can take advantage of these so hard. You just need to make sure that you're casting a decent number of spells. Like I said, it's not that... It's just... It's still good because a, a two mana rock that taps for one each turn is good. That's decent. That's and the floor, really. That's the floor. Uh, but... <laughs> that's the ceiling is very very this, high the ceiling is so high if you can if you're storming off doing anything with these you can just cast four spells you it tap for four mana that's com- completely insane completely insane these are all expensive except maybe the green one not that that matters they're in high demand I, they can get reprinted so i'm hoping that happens soon yeah i believe the red one is the most expensive really i think it's seen i think it saw play in legacy so oh. it, got a, it got a nice spike there maybe maybe part of like bergy something like that it was some it was a, it was a, it was the mono red storm deck okay uh so next white ramp i think we might do a whole video on white ramp not 100 percent sure yet but we have knight of the right orchid keeper of the accord archaeomancer's map savine's reclamation and trove warden white is actually pretty good at putting lands into play extra like real ramp so for the first three we listed here you have to be behind on land which is fine we don't always have we don't have to be the highest ramped person in the game especially when we're in white uh as long as you're not in green you play united white or okay just catch right back up get that land also if you're just on the um the draw if you're or you're not, the, you're not the if draw. you're not first if you're not first they play a land you get to turn three all of a sudden okay i play this first ramp ahead of them a ramp equal to them. Them playing land. Now I'm ahead of them. Yeah, and you it, the cost was nothing. And I'm sure it's probably similar with Archaeomancer's map. Yep. Keeper of the Court. Absolutely. It keeps you... I really like Keeper of the Court. It's four mana. It always is going to keep you with the highest person. You're just going to keep catching them in lands. Um, if you're tied for the most, who cares? You're doing great. And it gives you some creatures too. I love this card. The key is there's no investment. You just play it whenever. Play it as soon as you can. And then you don't. it doesn't ask anything of you ever. It goes, hey, you're going to get a land this turn and next turn and not this turn. It's fine. I mean, once you get one, I'm in. The card's worth it when you get one. And then anything other than that just feels like you're you're kind of just getting away with murder. Yep. Okay, Mancer's map is like burgeoning, you mentioned. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know about this one yet. It, it seems like it might be okay. Let us know. Uh, I, I'm going to put it in probably good needs more testing yes i agree it does it i've never played it either but i think it is good i really do think um i had a there was a nice i had a discussion in discord about this one too someone's like it's just a bad burgeoning i'm like yeah but you're not playing in the same decks yeah i mean knight of the white orchids a bad sakura tribe elder yeah exactly it's like 
we're not we're not playing these in the same decks. Um, mm-hmm. We're playing this in the white deck. That's probably it's one or two colors. It's white, one or two colors. It doesn't have green. Maybe it has artifacts too. Maybe it matters what the type is. Exactly. So, Savine's Reclamation. This card is amazing. This card is so so good. It is like better than half of the green ramp. It is really really good. The fact that you can mill it or discard it or whatever, it casts three ramp spells in one card. Just just nuts. So good with fetch lands. I think that versatility is what makes this card good. Because if it only got back lands from your grave, this card would be terrible. Yeah, it'd be worse. I might still try it. I I mean, I just have no idea. But the, if it, that were the case, you'd need fetch lands. But that's not the case. It can get back creatures, too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think this card would be um, close to unplayable if it did that. But you would, and the versatility of this card getting back permanent? Permanent? Three or less? It does a mini Sun Titan impression? I am in for this card. So in for this. It's the best one on... And best ramp spell in white. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, and then Trove Warden, what's that? Yes, yeah, so it's Landfall. You can, like, exile permanents. Same thing as Savine's Reclamation, except... Very similar to Savine's Reclamation. Landfall, exile one of those permanents three or less from your graveyard, and then when Trove Warden dies, you get all the ones you exile back. So it's like an investment plan. You can do creatures. You can do lands. It's eventually going to ramp you two, three, maybe. Yeah. These cards are completely completely reasonable and not, you're not insane, but white is the second best color for ramping. People love to say that white sucks with everything. It's nope. Sick. It's just the second best color for ramping. It just is. Show me the red ramp. <laughs> I don't, there isn't any. Uh... Trove Warden, I will say, it's really good with fetch lands too, because the first fetch land exiles something, and then when you fetch, the fetch lands in the graveyard to be exiled with the land that comes in. That's pretty sweet. I never actually thought about that. Yeah. Um, next we have two lands. These are the last two here. Mirror Landscape and Crochet Verge. Mirror Landscape is a non-green one I'm playing it in any non-green deck, where it's just a land that ramps you. I'm gonna I want that. I want that all day. Cross and Verge is for your green white decks, but it, when you crack it, it gets a forest in the plains. This can just straight up fix you if you, for your three color deck. You can get any shock duel, uh, your tap lands that cycle, all of those. If you're on a budget, you can get um, snow lands. Yeah, I mean, in four or five color budget, this looks like a slam dunk. If you have, let's say, you have the ten shock lands and nothing else, start playing cards like this. Yeah, I mean, you don't even need the shock lands. Like I said, you just you crack this cross inversion. Oh yeah, the the. The snow duels from Calhoun. Snow duels. Yeah, I meant snow basics. I'm like, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You get the snow duels. Yeah, you just get the. You go. I'll go get Arctic Tree Line and I don't know the red, black one. Well, don't get. I I was thinking get like the not the red. Don't get the red black one. I was thinking blue black. I'm like, no, no, no. no, That's stupid. Get get one you can actually get. Get green, blue, and white, red. Now, okay. Now you have four colors. That's way better. Yeah, it can produce any any four colors (laughs) that are Uh, green and white. So that's all of the ones that we would play. Uh, Maybe we missed one or two, but probably not many. We're moving in to traps now, and we'll explain why they're traps. First and foremost, we talk about all the time. Cultivate Kodama's Reach. There are decks that want these. They're few and far between. It's less... I mean, I don't have a percentage. I'm not going to throw out numbers like I'm a like I'm a pro or whatever. A pro. <laughs> it does not go in any deck where you have synergies with creatures, artifacts, enchantments, or anything but sorceries. I just think if you care about sorceries and like casting actual spells, yeah, it's probably pretty good. Uh, if you care about creatures at all... Uh, you just don't need it. I get that it's like a divination where you ramp and then draw a card, but it's a basic land. Not in for these. We've played them. We've tried it. We've seen it. I know it. I've played the other cards and they all perform better when I have synergies. Yes, exactly. I agree with that completely. We just don't, we don't need these because there's just enough cards that are going to give us synergies where we're just not going to play these ever. Oh, wait. And the best, the best thing is to mention they're good cards, like cultivating the Kodama's reach in a vacuum. They're not bad cards at all. There's the list of cards better than them when you're in various decks, the, the various lists of cards better. It's it's always at least 10. Exactly. Yeah. What happens What happens is you end up with a list of the best ramp spells counting synergies in my deck. And it always, it's just never, it never is going to make the cut very, but very, but these cards are good. And especially the thing that you're going to realize is if you, if you don't have something else and you just put the cultivate in, it's going to perform. Yes, and the floor is low, the f- but the ceiling could be better. No, the floor is high. The floor is high, but the ceiling could be higher when exactly. you play these other cards. Exactly, like, yeah. It's 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 just you're, you're taking this card that's going to be medium every time when you could have cards that just have synergy with your deck. These, like, yeah, it's medium every time, but the things you're missing out on are medium to great. Yeah, medium to great. Exactly. You can The, the synergies will really perform for you. Next, Rampant Growth, just not quite there. It's it's fine. Again, it w- you, you won't see a difference a lot of times from your three visits in a lot of decks, but the difference between this and three visits is... Actually big. It's actually big, yeah. And there's just no reason to 
This isn't budget. So in, on a budget, obviously, yeah, throw this in. This video is not taking budget into consideration is what you're saying. Yes, this is not a budget video. So rampant growth, unless you're on a budget, not even close to interested. No, I mean, you, you look at the cards better and you just, you just end up with, what am I playing again? You're like, Sakura Tribe, uh, tri Tribe Elder's better. Three visits, nature's lore, like there's three. Fire seek. And now now we're way and now now we're four at two, and that's just spells. Depends on what your deck needs. So bleh. uh next, other cards that are not bad, but have been strictly upgraded too many times. Explosive vegetation, vastwood surge, migration path, circuitous root. Veggies is the worst because it has no frills. And the rest of them all have a little tiny frills. If you're in budget, these cards are gonna be alright. But Sky Shroud Claim is the king. No one can dethrone it right now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You want to play these on a budget and as soon as you're off a budget and you're like upgrading that slot get sky shroud claim in and then don't play any of these other ones yeah i think it's really the only four mana ramp you you can need yeah i agree with that uh next we have search for tomorrow which i don't like this card at all if you don't have it on turn one i just think it's bad that's all there is to it if if maybe turn two but then when you pay three to put a land to the play on tap no thank you it's only one at three mana not interested far wanderings okay let me explain why this one's bad. This one I really don't like. Yeah, yeah. It's three mana, get one basic. Okay, that's that's a terrible rate. Bad rate. Bad rate. Then, but if you have threshold, which is seven cards in your graveyard, it gets three into play. You only have... Okay, even if you're milling and putting stuff into your graveyard, when is that? Turn five, six? Well, if you're a self-mill deck and you care about the types of things in your graveyard, I'm willing to bet it's either lands or creatures. This isn't those things. Take it out of your deck. Yes. Grow from the Ashes is three mana to put one in play untapped. Nine inches to the King Kick. Still still just not quite good enough. Not going to have enough synergies. Beanstalk Giant, I tried it. I really did. I thought, I'm playing Stompy. I want big Stompy creatures. You you never have time to cast the other half. And the ramp spell is a bad ramp spell. It's like, all right, if I'm going to play the other half and the other half is going to be good, it might be cool. The other half was never good. I played it at least five times before I said, okay, this is out. This yeah. is to get this out of here. When you pay three mana to put a land into play tapped, you're at worse than rampant growth, which is already a card we wouldn't play. When you pay three mana to put a land into play untapped, you are now at three mana exactly uh, rampant growth instead of worse. You're now exactly rampant growth. And we're not playing rampant growth. So why would we play these three, three mana spells that put one in untapped? It's just worse than rampant growth. But when you take three visits, which is two mana, and then puts it untapped, so it costs one... That's not a spell you can get anywhere else. Yes, exactly. I agree. That is a great way to put it. Next, mana doublers. Decks want these. Believe me. There are plenty of decks that want to play your mana doublers. But not every deck. But not every deck. And that's why it's in traps. You need to make sure when you play your mana doubler to double your mana from 10 to 20. Sure. That you can use the 20 mana. That's what it's there for. When you're doing that and you're able to use all of the mana efficiently, great, great cards. Yeah. But if you're not doing that, just don't just throw these in your deck because they're not, they're just, they're not generically good. Now, if you have a mana sink commander, the first two that come to mind are like Thrasios and Zakama. This, they can be really, really strong. If you've got a bunch of Helix Pinnacle random effects where you can just dump endless amounts of mana, X spells, uh, activated abilities of, you know, your Hydras and stuff, Steelbane Hydra is randomly what came to my head, then yeah, they're going to do work for you. But if you're just a, a normal deck slinging cultivates, I don't know what this is going to help you. Yep, just to state it one more time, they're in traps not because they're bad, but because people fall into the trap of just throwing it in any deck. Perhaps overplayed. Yes, overplayed is a great way to put it. Template Discovery. This card's not bad. This card is this card's also not bad. Three and a green, search your library for a land, put it onto the battlefield, okay? Each opponent could then choose to do that. If they do, you do it again. This card is fine. It really is fine. As soon as your playgroup learns how to play against this card, it becomes awful. Because what they really should do every single time is all say no. And all of a sudden, they all say no. Four mana, get my get a land in the play. Could have played Piers Whim. Could have played Piers Whim and made you sacrifice something. Got oh. a four for one. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, I I like the... It's funny to think about everybody getting strip mined and then taking out your three best lands. That's not really going to happen. Especially, I mean, someone could just draw it and have played it already. That's really not going to happen. It's good. The feel bad is they all say no correctly and let you just play a bad spell. It's the problem with a lot of these pre-con commander cards where like if everyone's game and they want to play along, this card's really cool and fun. And if they don't, it's just a bad card. And then they go, looks like a bad card. Yeah. <laughs> and you just play a bad card. Yeah, I agree completely. This card is fun. So don't don't just it's this is a trap because if people know how to play against it, it's gonna be it's gonna be bad. But the fun of like 
Eh? Please? Uh, well, me and you? We're friends, and that I love. There is a lot of game and a lot of fun to it because I love the if you get if you get the first guy to say yes, the guy's like, "Well, screw you! You said yes, I'm saying yes." Yeah, and then <laughs> and then I frustratingly I go like, "Time to clean up," and I go get a strip mine and try to figure out what the best land is. <laughs> I feel like I've seen people cast this. I don't really cast this card, but I've seen people cast it, and then someone else gets a better land than them, and it's really awkward. Yeah, that also happens. And cabal coverage, like, oh yeah. Oh no! Crap. That's not what I wanted to deal with at all. Uh, next, Colony Heart Expedition. This is a landfall card that I just think ends up being too slow. I, it's good early, and but it's really bad late. Yeah, exactly. Too slow. I agree with you completely on that. It does get two lands. It's okay. Doesn't ramp you from two to three, what or two to four? What does it ramp you from? Like two to five eventually, but it's like. Four to seven, kind of? Yeah, exactly. And Awakening Zone, it makes one ones on your upkeep. It's really slow. Really slow. Really slow. Not, I'm not interested in that card. And I have heard a lot of... This has come up. I, why has this come up so much? It has come up to me at least five separate times. I haven't is, heard it. Which is insane. People suggest, a ra as a ramp card, Yava Maya Elder. It's not a ramp card. Let's read it. it it's just not. It's one green green for a 2-1. When it dies, you search your library for two basic lands, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle, and then pay two and sack it to draw a card. What part of this is ramp? It doesn't. It searches for lands and puts them in your hand. Yeah, no, yeah. I've just heard people talk about it being ramp. It's just it doesn't ramp you. I think this card is very bad. Just, just too slow. Just almost just horrible. I think. Just like, it's just like glacially slow, and I it doesn't ramp you. So don't play it. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's ramp like you you lay out your deck and you have your deck in piles. Like this is my removal ramp card draw. This is my deck's theme. Thinking cards are related to the theme. Uh, all these cards are trying to synergize. Where does this card go? It's not ramp, so it doesn't go into the ramp pile. Uh, other, other. It's its own. It's its own piece of poop. Yeah. So that was our traps, and well, as well as our favorite cards that we always play. The video's done. The video is over. Special shoutouts to all of our patrons. We love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable. Honestly, the support we've been getting from patrons is unbelievable, overwhelming, overwhelming, and we love you all so much. And make sure, if you're a patron, that you're in the Discord because you get benefits in the Discord if you're a patron. But that's not just for the patrons. It's for everybody. Discord link in the description below. Click it. Join. Come say hi to us. TCG player link. That's our affiliate. You probably know by now. There's a link in the description made just for you. Click it. Navigate to TCG player. Then buy cards like you would anyway because everybody buys magic cards. Now when you buy magic cards, follow me, we get money that doesn't come from you. So you spend extra, zero dollars extra, we get a kickback on the order. You just help support the channel. It's a free roll. Yes. And how do you guys like that little tiny video I've been playing? Uh, they, the TCG player sent it to me. It's cute. It's cute. We're it's cute. It's it. got like Killian and Dina and all the all those characters in there. And it's just a little cute animation. And it, makes, it has some music. I like it. Okay. And the tidbit, I guess, I, I wasn't thinking of one, but I thought of one at the very last second. Uh, this is the first episode of Nitpicking Nerds history where I am wearing a shirt that is not Nitpicking Nerds and is magic oh yeah first time ever okay cool that's really i don't know what to say if you go back i'm never ever wearing a magic shirt uh i so something interesting i was watching limited resources um and they brought up the fact that they were they were doing their first impression episode okay and they mentioned it's like it doesn't feel like first impression it feels oh like yeah it just in like i was thinking the same thing strixhaven's been out for what four, four five days four days it feels like the set's been out for like five, six weeks because we've we've already been able to play it and enjoy it and like look at it. It's so cool. And I love that we get these sets so much faster and it feels so much cooler to just jump into it. Yeah, I will say though, uh, not to brag, but my win rate is pretty good with Strixhaven. What is it? It's like 67%. Dang! Yeah. I, not, it was not I was not in bad. like high 50s. Yeah. I mean, I'm up in the Mythics. We're, we're battling it around That's awesome. 99 and less. I was definitely up there when I first, like at the beginning of the season, but I had that rough streak. So I guess we're just chaining together tidbits because my IRL win percentage in Strixhaven draft is 0%. Yes, it I is. I mean, in sealed though, 100%. Because um, I went 4-0 in that event we did. I, I'm, I'm a 3-0 in... Uh, You're 3-0 in draft and I'm 0-3 in draft. Yeah, 3-0 in draft. Yeah, I, I, my deck was awesome last week. I liked it. All right. We can't do any more tidbits. We can't. That's the end can't. of our tidbits. Yeah. Peace out, Tribe Scout.